Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. And this is episode number 10. This week, I'll be interviewing the amazing Kurt Walters, known for his monumental Grand Canyon paintings, but so much more. And I've learned about a lifetime project he's working on, and he'll be sharing that with you, plus some of the secrets of his success as an artist. In the Plein Air podcast, we delve into the world of outdoor painting called Plein Air painting. For those of you who don't know, Plein Air in French essentially means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others pronounce it Plain Air. But no matter what you call it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is all about the movement, the painters, the collectors, the galleries, and the art. This week's podcast is brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, the world's largest gathering of Plein Air artists, and it's coming up April 15th through 19th in Tucson, Arizona. And I think, yep, I think there's a strong possibility we're going to sell this one out, and it may be very soon. You can register before March 24th and save $200. That's right. Register before March 24th. Save $200. Bucks, www.plenairconvention.com. Now, as you know, I want to see more people fall in love with plein air painting, and you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends to help them learn about plein air painting. Share it on social media or on email, and I hope you'll subscribe to it and get it every week. You can find it at outdoorpainter.com and hit the podcast button. All right. If you have feedback or interview requests, you can reach me, Eric, at plenairmagazine.com. All right. I received a very nice email from a listener who was a little disappointed in the podcast we did recently on Cuba because we didn't talk much about where we painted and what we painted. And it was good feedback, and I appreciate it. I want that feedback from you. Our listenership is up well over 12,000 people now, and we want to continue to have it grow. And the only way that's going to happen is if we listen to you. In a nutshell, though, I wanted to answer his question. Aside from touring Cuba, we painted mostly in Old Havana, Central Havana, Havana, the countryside, and local fishing villages. Most of the paintings were of old buildings, people, and old cars, and there were lots of interesting people in traditional Cuban costumes. So a lot of us did portraits in the streets, and we usually gave them some money to sit for us. In only one case, we painted as a full group so that we could get lots of photos of people painting together in the same area. Otherwise, we went off in bus-sized groups, 30 or 40 people, to different areas of town, and we got dropped off. And most of us went off on our own. We felt safe everywhere we went, and we could roam freely. And in some case, we even paid the drivers to let us paint their cars, keep them parked so they didn't have to drive them off as taxis. In others, we found parked cars that were not moving. So that's a little bit of the sense of Cuba. We felt very safe, and I think we will go back. Uh, keep a watch on your email. Uh, we'll announce another trip coming up soon. Today's interview is brought to you by easelbrushclip.com, and we're interviewing Kurt Walters, amazing, amazing painter, one of the great masters of our day. Let's get right to it. Well, Kurt, thank you for doing the call today. You're welcome. Um, I, I'm curious about learning all about you. You and I have never met in person, so I'm very... No, I, I know you from Facebook book, you know, I, from your articles. I know all the stuff. But... <laughs> well, that's dangerous. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we start out by going back into time and understanding how this whole art thing began for you? You know, I was raised, I was raised in New Mexico and in the Four Corners. And I think I think I just always had a bent for for wanting to draw and paint, and the landscape was always beautiful where I grew up. And uh, uh, I don't know, I just you know I just gravitated to art. I think it was a very natural thing for me to do. Did you have any any uh, influences early on? Any parents or anyone that kind of drove yeah. you in that direction? You know, you know, what was interesting to me is that is that, that when I really when when my dad finally my dad had done a little bit of painting and he, he was a dentist. And so he had a very sort of academic mind towards painting. But but anyway, um, so when I was a kid and I was I was still in junior high school, he said, we have to learn. You have to learn how to stretch your own canvas and make your own stretcher bars and prime your own canvas and do all that stuff. And so and so that's what we did. Then he sent me to the local 
sort of craft teachers the, the best he could. And so he was supportive and the best, you know, what he could do. Uh, it was later on at the, when I went up to the, uh, it was a branch of New Mexico State University in Farmington. And there was a teacher there by the name of Lola Furman, who had a huge influence on my early work. And she was, uh, uh, she'd been a student of Kenneth Adams. And so she had, um, uh, her approach was, was, well, it was great. She, she, she taught me a lot, actually. And uh, going back to your teen years when your dad had you stretching canvas and so on, uh, sure. had you expressed interest in this or is this something he was kind of pushing on you? No, no, it was totally my interest. And, and as a matter of fact, they kind of fought me on it for a while and until they finally gave in and finally got my paint set and finally started buying our supplies for me. Um, you know, I, he would make me work in the hay fields to buy paint, you know, to get the money to buy paint. And so he did make me work at it, but he was very, he actually was very supportive. So you lived on a farm. Oh yeah. We lived out in the country. It was, uh, you know, I grew up, uh, building fence and milking cows and slopping hogs and, you know, like the whole thing, seriously. <laughs> Something you probably don't want to do again. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I get that. I have. That. I can do it. I can do it, and I can do it when I have to. I just prefer not to. Yeah, I have a similar background, uh, so we'll get into that at another time. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you make the transition? Uh, you you went to college. Um, yes. And then, did you transition into becoming a professional at that point? Well, I kind of. I actually, the truth is, yes. I I, I discovered that I could sell paintings and. Uh, course, not very much at the time. And, and obviously they were very naive for their, for the time being. But, but anyway, um, you, you know, when I was in my early, when I was in my late teens, I discovered I could sell a few paintings, you know, I could get 15, 20 bucks for a painting, which was more than I could make all week, you know, doing hay chores. And so, um, uh, yes, I found myself going to school and, and paying tuition and doing all kinds of stuff with my art. I, Dropped out of school for about for about six seven months. I lingered around Farmington, having a little art supply store and teaching art classes. And then I decided to move to then then I did a crazy thing, which was I decided to get married. And shortly thereafter, we moved to Taos, New Mexico, which was the smartest thing I've ever done. So you got uh, you got married at a pretty young age. I, well, I just turned 21 when I got married. Yeah. So yes, it was pretty, it was yeah. pretty young. And, and where do you live now? I live in Sedona. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I moved from, I moved from Taos in 79 and, um, uh, I've loved living here ever since. I, I love Sedona. I think it's awesome. So what were the influences of Taos at the time you were there in what the 1970s? I was there in the seventies. So I, I moved there. I moved there in seventy, the end of seventy four, and I, I I loved it. I absolutely. I, I love. I still love Taos. Um, I still go back frequently, actually. But um, the thing the thing about Taos that that was important to me at the time is that I had decided that I wanted to win the Stacy Scholarship. So I started knocking on on doors of. And I don't know if you've heard of the Stacy Scholarship, but. The reason I wanted it is that all of my idols, you know, the uh, Gonski had won the scholarship and Goebel had won. And, and there and there had been a number of, of artists along the way that I admired that had all won the scholarship. And it was for it was for young artists between the ages of 21 and 30. And so uh, I really wanted to do that. And so uh, I started knocking on these guys' doors and they were very generous to me and all of the Taos Artist Valley guys were very good, and um, they let me go paint with them. They wouldn't necessarily weren't teachers; they were painters, and they would just let me go paint with them. Um, then I got acquainted with I wrote Wilson Hurley a letter, and so he would let me come down and and he would critique my work. I would leave in tears every time, but that was okay. <laughs> um, it, it were good lessons, and he was. Uh, he was a huge influence on my early work. He was really huge. So you would leave in you would leave in tears because he was being uh, harsh. I I th I don't think the word was harsh. I think he was just so academic about his approach that 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 
it was it was a matter of you were right or you were wrong, and I was always wrong. Huh. And so, I mean, eventually, eventually, I started catching on to how he how he kind of thought and worked, and and he was actually quite brilliant. But um, he he had he had no emotional content in his work. You know, I mean, I, in all honesty, it was it was it lacked a whole lot of of expression that I found in the other artist in, in Taos. And so uh, I was always torn between those, those, those concepts of, 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 you know, big, bold paint and great big paintings with lots of paint and lots of emotion versus Hurley, who approached everything from a very academic and uh, sort of viewpoint. So, so I have not had the pleasure of seeing any of your work in person uh, that I can recall. Oh, really? No kidding. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. we're going to change that here very soon. But um, so, so would you say that your your in terms of your style, your paint quality, are are you talking about a lot of thick paint? Um, when I look at your paintings in photographs, they they look very they look like you can see the weave of the canvas. Is that not the case? No, this is it, it. It depends on my mood and the period of my work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, my work is kind of like on a pendulum. It kind of swings back and forth all the time, and and I think it really does come from those Tausch years and those influences. And 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 so I get I get in the studio, and the the paintings become the, they start becoming more. Um, they get tighter and tighter and tighter, and until I can't stand it anymore, and then I outdoors and then they become looser and looser and looser and uh um it's, it's just i i don't know why i'm that way but that's what i do and, and does that drive the uh the galleries nuts or do they do they like that well I, no for the most part it drives them nuts um because you know that you know galleries are are and i i think it's human nature for the most part but you know once the, if they sell a painting then they want another one just like it yeah. and uh yeah. Uh, they, they, they can't help it. That's their salespeople. That's the way they make their living. And I understand that, but that doesn't mean that's what I want to do. Uh, yes, it drives them nuts. Uh, um, I, I, what's interesting to me is that I, I went through like, I went through this really, I went through a period where they were incredibly expressionistic, uh, uh, during the mid nineties and, and painting huge, huge canvases outdoors with a lot of paint. Uh, those, those paintings, and so I filled the galleries with lots and lots and lots of these paintings. Um, and now they say, oh, can you go back and do that again? Well, no, that's not what I'm doing now. But, you know, I, it's kind of interesting. Every period has has collectors and every period has has advocates. And, and so I just find it interesting. Been there, done that. Well, you you're, you're probably get bored with what you're doing and you want to you want to try new things all the time. Well, I'm always trying new things. I, I seriously, I am. I think that's part of the reason I like to travel. I, I enjoy new challenges. Uh, uh, you know, I love painting architecture, which not too many people know too much about. But you know, I, I love painting architecture. Um, I, I just like I like the challenges of what's down the road, and so, which is of course my newest thing, the conquistador thing. But anyway, yeah, yeah I want to I want to I want to probe on that in a second. I, I I think that architecture painting is one of the most challenging things that I've I've well, tried because it's yeah, so hard to make it look right. Yeah, it is. It's very difficult. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you literally have to understand linear perspective to to draw architecture. If you don't get it, then they're not going to look right. Yeah. So. So I, I want to back up just a second before we get into conquistador paintings. <laughs> the um, you, when you were you had moved to Taos, you were going outdoors and painting. Was that when you first started doing your first plein air work, or were you doing that all along? No, I've actually been doing it all of my life. Um, I, I I was painting even back in those days. I first, I mean, the first thing I did was take my paint sets out and, and start painting outdoors. I've I've always done it. It's, and and it's, uh, is that what your dad did? No, actually, he didn't. Um, but that was my my nature to do that. He must have thought you were a freak. Oh, I don't I don't think he thought I was a freak, <laughs> but he thought I was wasting my time. <laughs> So uh, for the benefit of the people who are, are listening to this who might not know your work, uh, which I would find hard to imagine, quite frankly, but um, we kind of think of you as you've kind of been pigeonholed as kind of a Grand Canyon painter, but that's not the case at all, is it? 
Well, I, actually, it's not. It, 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 I granted it encompasses a lot of my work. It encompasses a, a great deal of it, but and it's close, and I love it, and and I continue to challenge me, but but I do a lot of different stuff. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the things that you do. Um, first off, let, let's start with the Grand Canyon. Um, okay. You you obviously have become very well known for that. Your pieces are monumental and they're magnificent and it it Thank just you. seems like um I, I don't know that anybody can do it like you can do it it's very kind thank you how did that all come about is it something you, it became a muse for you uh in in essence yes when, when i was 19 i saw the grand canyon for the first time and and i decided i i, I just got my first car graduated high school I decided I was going to go to Grand Canyon. I had ten dollars and quarters. I'd been busting tables actually, and so I decided I was going to go paint Grand Canyon. And I got there, and it was so overwhelming. It was so big. It was so vast, and it was so so unbelievably difficult to draw and paint. Uh, of course, I threw the canvas away in disappointment. But but it became sort of a challenge to me, and and that's when. And it was shortly after that that I discovered uh, I discovered Wilson Hurley was doing great paintings of it. My I it, it led me to go to you know uh, to to the museums and start seeking out paintings of Grand Canyon. That's what it did, and so <clears throat> I became acquainted with all the sorts of Grand Canyon painters, which actually there were few around in those days. You didn't see any of them hardly at all, and so. Um, I don't know. It just became a challenge, and so it always has been one of my go-to places that that gets me fired up, and I love it. And I still I still experience that that rush when I go to the rim that I did back when I was nineteen. So that's about what is that? About an hour and a half away from you? Uh, it takes me two hours to drive up there if the traffic's not bad, and the weather's not bad. Uh, it's it's not a bad drive at all, and uh, uh, so if it's a uh, and and I'm kind of spoiled at this point. I've, I I get to live so close that 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 I only go up when the weather's great and uh, for what I want. You know, you you can watch these. You know, you can you can see the weather on weather cams now. And 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 so if the if it's really stormy and beautiful, then I head up. So so when you when you do these paintings, uh, are you focusing on, uh, do, do you start out with a smaller plein air study or are you taking the big canvases on location? Mostly. It kind of depends. It depends on, on if there's time to paint during the day. If the weather is is conducive to that, then yes. Uh, I always have my sketchbook with me. I, I, I mean, I'm always, I for the most part, uh, I, I set up and paint. So I was just up there the other day and, and I painted and, and uh, uh, so I did several little paintings, you know, just... Uh, uh, of the weather, following the weather patterns, and and so that's not unusual for me to do that sort of thing. I uh, the the one painting I think will turn into a great big painting in the studio because I had great storms going on and it was really awesome and 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 I loved that. It was a view from from near the near Yalpa Pai, uh trailhead of the, the the overlook there. And so anyway, it was really it was really cool. It was really fun, and I think I'm going to paint that for. Pretty West, and I only have a month left, and so I'm in trouble. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must like the pressure. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure, but I always put myself in that position anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, Can't help it. Well, that, it's nice to have deadlines because that way you get things done. I painted the Grand Canyon for the very first time uh, when I went up there for spring break last year when I took my kids up there, and I, oh, yeah. I snuck oh, yeah. out early in the mornings and painted, and yeah. uh, I found it to be really challenging, incredibly complicated. It uh, is. How, how do you do it? Do you simplify things really down to basic shapes? And then uh, what's your process like? The process the process for me is to find a, a general position and draw out from that and paint out from it. And and so uh, the, the, the plein air paintings um, are, are not, of course, they're not as controlled. You don't have as much time as the studio work. But the, but, but the process involves a whole lot of drawing and so that first part of of that painting you know i always start like i i always know that i'm going to start uh, you know an hour or two hours ahead of time just for the drawing part of grand canyon you don't just you can't 
just, you, you know, you try to nail the light and the shadows in the later part of the painting because it's just not going to happen in that first part because it's going to switch too much and change too much on you. Um, it's just a complicated geology. Knowing it helps, you know. I mean, you just have to know the geology of the canyon to, to understand how to draw it. And so, so you're drawing it out with, with a pencil or charcoal or no, something? No, 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 I usually draw with paint. You're I drawing usually draw paint. it with paint, yeah. Yeah, sometimes I use charcoal, but... but you know, I take my charcoal sticks with me, but but no, for the most part, it's just easier to do it in paint. I stand back with a big brush, and and so I can sort of look at the canyon and the canvas at the same time, and and come up with the. You know, I started out with trying to, to to put as much of that of that general composition that I want in the in the painting, and and sometimes they go stretch out of the canvas, and <laughs> sometimes they don't. <laughs> so tell me about. Conquistadors. What are you doing? I've always had a I've always had a fascination with the with the, with the Coronado expedition into the Southwest. It happened in the year 1540, a long time ago. But but when you grow up in New Mexico, it's kind of part of your history. But the part of it, the part of the story that really fascinates me is when Garcia Lopez de Cardenas took a, a group. They say 25 mounted. Um, Anyway, Coronado was in in Cibola, which is now which is Zuni Pueblo, and he sent he sent Cardenas off to discover the Grand Canyon. And so they had heard about the Great River, and so they 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 went by and they picked up some Hopi Indians and they went to the edge of the Grand Canyon. And of course, they tried to go down. And um, with him were were not only the the the, the, the caballeros, the, the soldiers, but there were also they also had 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 African slaves. They had had Moors with them. They had they had the 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 Indian amigos, which would have been the Aztec Indians and from tribes of Indians from Mexico along. And so it was this very cultural experience going on at the edge of Grand Canyon at this moment in time. And they they tried to go down. They he sent three men down to try to find the river. Of course, they couldn't make it down, but. And they were only there for three days. But I think it's just fascinating that these Europeans discovered Grand Canyon in 1540. So what are these paintings that you're doing? Are they figurative paintings? Well, right. Yes, they are. And so and so I really have been studying uh, the, the, the history of this event and the, the history of the Coronado expedition and buying uh, armor and reproductions, mostly, trying to... to, to, to to figure out the, the the story and it's it, many more details than I ever imagined, um, but but it, it kind of started out with a painting. I was commissioned to a painting back in '76, so that was a long time ago. But I was you know, and when you're a kid, you know, and you're starving, you'll say you you know you'll try anything. Right. And and this this gentleman came to me and he said he said I've been doing this research about about the about the Conquistadors of Grand Canyon. Would you would you do a painting for me based on my history? And I said, Well, of course, I can paint anything. Well, obviously I couldn't, but but I I certainly gave it a whirl and I tried and it and it was for the most part pretty good. Uh, but 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 anyway, so this painting popped up uh, in the form of a slide in my I was digging through looking for something I don't know why but. Anyway, um, I, this 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 photograph of this painting popped up, and 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 it was just right after I'd returned from Spain in 2011, and I had been in Toledo, and of course I was fascinated with the armor, and and I just decided that that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do it again, but at this time I want to do it correctly, and I want to study it and do it the right way, and so. Uh, so what I did is I started inviting models into the studio to to uh, do nude figures first, and so that's been very fun. It's been a lot of fun actually, and um, so so from those I've gone into to having costumes made and and having everything everything. It requires requires horses and costumes and uh, lessons in history, and I mean it's just it's fascinating to me, but. So that's what I'm doing. And, and have you executed any of those paintings yet, or are you still? I have. I, I I've done a few finished drawings. I've done a few finished drawings. Um, 
of my main character. And so, you know, I'm assigning costumes and 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 titles to to all these different models I'm finding, and to keep them coming over is kind of a challenge. You know, they're all young men, and so and and there were only men on the trip. On that trip, there were there were there were whole families actually that went on the expedition, but only to the Grand Canyon. They only speak of the men going. So, but anyway, that's what I've been doing. It's it's just fascinating to me, and and um, I I'm not so certain how how if if I can actually if I'm up to the challenge or not, but I'm certainly going to try. Have Have you been yeah. doing figure paintings over the years? I well, not as much as I should have been doing, uh -huh. and so and so part of the part of the problem was that every time I go down to the yeah, and this is I don't have any other way to explain it. I would go down. I would go down to the to the arts. Uh, I'd go down to the art center or go to a figure drawing class, and and because everyone knows me and they they, they knew me from all the other stuff, they would want to always watch me paint. Well, I was there as a student and wanted to learn to do figure drawing, and so uh, it was it was difficult to do that. To have everyone watch me do figure drawing, which I couldn't do. Right. And so, or, or you know, I wasn't adequate at it. And so then, then so so I would I had a tendency to kind of not do that, and so and so I finally decided I would just do it in the studio, and which is a lot more fun. And I've gotten to know my my models very well, and uh, uh, they're they're nice nice people that've been coming into the model for me, and so I I've enjoyed it a lot. Well, I would imagine being well known and having the pressure of having to produce decent drawings on something you don't know how to do very well would be difficult. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was difficult. <laughs> it's difficult to do that. Yes. Well, that's that's pretty neat because it's it sounds like you're really stretching yourself and really growing. Well, I'm I'm trying. I I it, anyway. That's that's my that's my uh, uh, more mature challenge at the moment. So, so what is the plan? Are you going to do a, a series of larger paintings, uh, smaller ones? Well, What's... you know, you know, the, the the plan for me is to is to first start doing some some small just some small studies uh, to do with the with the figures themselves, and then to go into before and actually do. So I've been actually doing some paintings at, up at Grand Canyon. Um, getting the model, you know, I can I can sneak one or two models at a time. Uh, when I had four up there at a time, the Park Service frowned on it a little bit. They didn't quite like that, but you know I'm supposed to have a special use permit for that. Um, so I, I can sneak by with one or two models at a time up there, and so that's what I've been doing. Yeah, that's a whole other story that we could get into. I'm sure. I don't know that I'll ever actually. I won't miss. I won't have to have a whole event up there, but uh, uh, you know, I, I, it's it's fun. It's fun. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. So over the years, um, throughout your career, what paintings have most inspired you? Uh, paintings that others have done. Paintings that others have done. I, I think well, there's actually hundreds of them. But um, there's there's a Spanish painter by the name of Carbonaro. Do you know who I'm talking about? He did a, he did this great painting of of um, I forgot the name of the painting. Anyway. Um, you, you can see his work at, at, the, at the El Prado in Spain, you know, in Madrid. And God, those paintings are awesome. You know, the, if you've been to El Prado, you'd know the painting of the, of the, of the wife that's in the coffin dying and the, oh, and the, oh. oh yeah, you, you know that painting. Yeah, I know the painting. Yeah. I, I was yeah. there last yeah. year. I took a group of, of art collectors and, uh, oh, that room. Just yeah, amazing. awesome. The guy, the guy was only like 38 when he did that painting. It just like blows your mind. It's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, and then across the room, there's that that guy in the big chair. I don't remember the name of that painting. I don't. Oh know yeah, that. that's one of his paintings too. Is just it? yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah, incredible, incredible. I mean, that's real. That's 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 real knowledge, uh, dressmanship, and paint skills. It's unbelievable. I'd like to switch gears for a second. One of the sure. things I'm very curious about is that um, you have become um, very notable as a painter. You're very collectible. Uh, the prices of your work, I think, are probably about as as high as they've ever been. And 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 um, you, you know, you you have orchestrated your career beautifully. Whether that was intentional or not, I don't know. But I 
uh, because I talk a lot about art marketing, about curious about that. How did you, how did you build your career, get, um, get that, get into that, you know, upper 1% of painters. And, <laughs> I didn't know that yeah, I was there, but yeah, thank you're you. a 1%. Of, <laughs> um, and, you know, how did you get there? Um, and, and was it a conscious effort? Yes, absolutely. What happened was that, that as, as a young person, I, 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 I was introduced, of course, to the Pretty West Show, which was unbelievable to me because all of a sudden here was this place, and this this was in the this was in the, you know 1980. Anyway, the here 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 was a place where where there were great great paintings by living artists, and you could walk in and look at these things, and they were just unbelievably good. And I said that's where I wanted to go. That was what I wanted to do. And so, and so my early part of my life, of course, was geared towards trying to get into that show, which, by the way, which, by the way, I sent in 20 letters and got 20 rejections before being invited to Pretty West. So it was um, 20 years in a row, 20 years in a row. Yeah, I did it for 20 years. Wow, you're very um, persistent. That's <laughs> pretty determined. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I have 20 of those letters. I think that's a, I think that's a very important point for for other people to hear because there's there's this sense from many that you know they look at someone like yourself and the success that you're having and there's probably this sense that you had this instant career and to to know no, that you were nothing, rejected 20, 20 no. years in a row and that there you kept nothing. trying is magnificent. I, I I I will tell you Eric though that they did me a huge favor. And and I am grateful now. At the time, I, I thought I was being abused, of course, and that I was being rejected. Honestly, it wasn't. It was because it's because you know Wilson Hurley was on that board, and those and those those guys had a lot of wisdom that were on that old novel crowd. They had enough wisdom to realize that young people didn't really belong in that in that arena. They and they really don't. Um, well, there are young people in there now. They, yes, I know there are. Uh, <laughs> you want to say anything about that? I don't, I, I think, I think that, that when you are in your thirties and for the most part, for most of your forties, you should be experimenting. You should be painting, painting elsewhere. I don't think, I don't think the museum shows are, are necessarily good for you. They force you into being repetitive and doing the same things over and over again and it's, and it takes a mature artist to say no to those sorts of things and and to, to succumb to those pressures. I, well, that's a I, huge I, temptation, though. I, I would imagine it's, because it's huge. It's, it's, it's good huge. money and it's great notoriety. And 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 they, they and and so and so that's that's kind of what the problem is. And I understand I understand wanting to be in those shows. And I understand that, but. You know, a guy in his 30s should be out playing and finding all sorts of things to paint and 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 experimenting. And so, Mr. Hurley did me a huge favor by telling me no. He was, um, and and he was, he, and then when I finally did get in Pretty West, he was very competitive. And uh, uh, but anyway, that's another story all in itself. But anyway, um, but but to answer your question about the career thing, I. I I decided that, that that that's pretty much what I wanted, and so I was always sort of geared myself towards the goal of being in that show, uh, or being part of that show, and so it for kind of it kind of my mindset to do that. But then when I was in my when I around oh I don't know back in the early nineties, I, I I I finally figured out that I could hire a public relations person, which nobody ever used back in those days. And and I got hold of a couple of really good people to help me, and so they would do press releases and and sorts of, and articles for me and send them in to newspapers, and I would get coverage on things I was doing, uh, and it was cheaper than buying advertising, and so that's kind of the way I went. So you 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 built the notoriety and the career on two things primarily, press releases and pre to west. That's pretty much it. Now the twenty years that you weren't in pre to West, were you selling enough paintings to survive? Oh yeah, of course. Yes. No, I was actually doing quite well. I had I had great shows. At, uh, my primary gallery was Trillside, 
-hmm. And I also was I was also with with Alterman Galleries in those days, and before that, um, Linda McAdoo back in the old days in in um, Santa Fe. And they, they did great shows for me. I had I had lots of one man shows, and I loved it. I, I was painting a lot, and 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 uh, Trailside was was amazingly good to me. They would allow me to have. I, I did it one year. I did nothing but a Bali show. I went to Bali and painted, and and so I did I did twenty Bali paintings, and uh, that, you know it was awesome. It was fun. Sounds like fun. It was a lot of fun. So. How would you like to be remembered? How would you like the, uh, you know, if, if, if it all came to an end today, heaven forbid, uh, how would you like the, the world to remember you? The, 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 the honest truth is, as an American artist, I, I think I just, I, wanted, I think I want to be known as a really good American artist. That's what I want. I, I just, uh, I, to, to define me as, as I, 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 I understand that, that Grand Canyon has been my focus of my life, but but uh, for the most part, but I think it, I think I'm bigger than that. I think uh, I think I do more things than just that, and so um, you know I I, th I think it's although I'm I understand I'm mostly a regional artist. I th think I've traveled enough and painted enough and been around enough shows all over the United States that I think just a really good American artist. It's been fascinating to watch uh, your posts on Facebook because you've been posting photographs of you painting uh, throughout your youth in, in pretty exotic places. And it's, it's been fun keeping up on that and tracking that. Yeah, well, it's I'm, been glad, fun. I'm, I'm glad you're noticing them uh, there. I, I just decided that since uh, of course I'm coming down for the plein air event that, it would be interesting for for those people who follow me and are going to be there. Would they might actually want to see all that stuff? So we have a lot of people who are listening to this who are trying to build their careers. They're trying to become better artists. Let's start there. If you're, I don't know if you do any teaching or not, but um, if if you were sitting down with a group of people and giving them advice on what they need to do to become better painters overall. Is there a particular area you'd go? Yeah. Yes. As painters. Yes. I, it's always, it's always just paint from life. The more you paint from life, the better you get. And, and the more you draw, the better you get. And so that's just, that's the, I don't know. Every time you do a painting from life, you sharpen your skills. And so it doesn't matter what it is you're drawing or painting, uh, as long as you're doing it from life. And, 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 and although I, it's obvious that I, that I go in my studio and it's obvious I paint using having my, my photographs at hand, but they all start from working outdoors. They, they all do. And you're not working from life. You're, you're not sharpening your skills. I think that's critical. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So if you had a magic wand, uh, you probably do, but if, if you had a magic wand and you could make any changes in the art world uh, today, what would they be? Oh, that's a tough question. I, don't, I honestly don't know. All I can say to that is that I don't think that, that, that galleries get enough credit for the early part of artists' careers. I don't, I don't think that they um, – you know, I th I, th I think it's really important that, that we not forget the art galleries and uh, and all of this stuff and and the importance that they have on on your. You, you know, I would never have had a career without Christy Mooring, and that's that's the real truth. Without Trailside Galleries, I that I would never have become the painter that I am, or 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 have the great life that I've had without her in my life, or without Mary Vaughn Lachey in my life. That just never would have happened, and so. Are there changes that I'd make in the art world today? I, I don't know. I think it's a pretty amazing place. I don't know that. I, I think it's pretty great, actually. I, I think it's very astute of you to to mention the galleries. The uh, the tendency today, uh, because people can put themselves out there on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, etc. Yeah. The yeah. the tendency is to think that's all I need to do. Uh, or I can sell. I don't think that's true. Right. Or I can sell direct. And, and, and I think that we tend to, you know, there's, there's a lot of D 
demonization of art galleries by some artists right now because you know they're they're whining about the you know the 50 percent or the 40 percent that they're taking and yet i don't think people really see the the valuable process of building a collector base of of marketing one's art of giving one advice and 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 also quite frankly selling while you're you're painting or selling while you're sleeping you know if you have to take all that on your yourself then suddenly it's a much bigger problem you're painting it's, it's a much bigger problem a, and you're you're trying to do everything yourself i i don't think you should do it. i i i you know the gallery system has worked for 100 for 200 years 300 years now i don't i i just can't imagine uh, an art market without our galleries in it. I, I just can't, you know, I, I have, I have, I still have two galleries that I work with. Uh, I work with, with Nidra Matucci. She's awesome. And, and I still work with Mary Von Lachey at Trailside. And so they are, they still handle my work and, and they're my go-to people when I need something. And, and I, you just cannot do without our gallery. But a good gallery is by your side. I mean, those, you know, I've been with Trailside for 40 years. I can't, I, I just can't imagine them not in my life, actually. Yeah. They're, they're a partner. A true they partner. are. They're, yeah. They're my partner. Yeah. And I, I would, I, I just, I just don't think that the, uh, although we have these, these great, we have Skype and we have all the great things now. We have the internet. We have all that stuff. It still needs to work hand in hand with somebody that is your, will be your advocate and tell you that, you know, to work for you when you, because you can't do it yourself. How do you see yourself in the next five to 10 years? Are you going to be doing con conquistador paintings or what, yes. what, what else have you not done that you've wanted to do? I still want to travel. I still want to travel. There's several, Oh, there's just so many hundreds of places I want to go paint. I, I just, I, I know I'll never get to them all, but I'm certainly going to try. Yeah, we. I yeah. I just took a group of a hundred artists to Cuba a couple of weeks ago. I know you did, and I'm oh. so envious. I'm so jealous. I, it was, I really. It was magnificent. It was really a lot I of fun. Did. I bet it was a lot of fun. I'm curious a little bit about technique. I don't want to get into it too much, but sure. um, you know, when you're painting in plein air, you're obviously painting in ala prima. Are, are you in, in a studio painting? Are you are you doing any glazing, uh, layering? Are you? Is it just you direct know, painting? <clears throat> on, on occasion, but for the most part, it's just direct painting. I, I usually start at a spot. Normally, the easiest thing to do for most landscapes is simply start with the sky. But that's not always the case, but for Grand Canyon, kind of work your way down. Sometimes sometimes I'll start in the center and work my way out, uh, but I always try to work in sections where I can work wet into wet always, and I, I hate scumbly paint. I just I detest it. So that's kind of that's kind of the reason I do what I do, and um, uh, I'm just not good at overlaying paint, and so that's why I work the way I do. Yeah, you know, I you get these magnificent atmospheric effects in your paintings. They they look again. I have not seen one in person, uh, but they look to me like the only way you could accomplish that effect would be with glazing uh, or with veils. Nope, it's not. No, I paint it all directly. That's I paint pretty, it all. Pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I really don't. I, I, glazing always d detracts from the painting to me. So it's just best to paint it right in. You know, you know what I do for the to speak to you about, about that sort of thing is that I lay the palette out really close, all before me. I mean, the, the paint's laid out in big old blobs of paint, and I paint. I mix a lot of paint. Uh, in fact, I waste a lot of paint. But... Um, I, I, I put it all out there and I, and that I, I paint every, I mix up a blob of paint for every little thing that I think I'm going to need in the painting before I start. And so I pretty much see the, see the, the, the painting on a palette before me, before I ever begin. And, um, it's kind of, it's kind of an old, it's part of that old Wilson Hurley thing coming out of me, but, and then I put the paint in the freezer for the duration of the paint of the, of the painting. And, um, uh, I take out what I need when I need it. And so that's kind of the way I do it. Cool. And what do you still get frustrated as a painter? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. What, yeah, what, fru I, 
What what frustrates you? I, I only you? I only have I, Eric. I only have I only have tipper tantrums on occasion, <laughs> and and you know if I have to if I've repainted something about the fourth time, then then I kind of have a tendency to be a little angry. But <laughs> you know <laughs> for the most part I'm pretty happy. So what is the biggest thing you've learned about yourself this year? Uh, that that I should never ever do another commission. <laughs> but anyway. Tell me about that. Well, they, they, they just become, they become, I become obsessed with making sure that it's what the client wanted or what the client liked. And so uh, I, I, I will tell you, I will tell you the story about this year is that I spent way too much time, uh, more time than I ever imagined I would do on a, on a huge Grand Canyon. And, and it, it turned out really very, very good, but, but and 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 the project ended up being a really nice project, but but it it absorbed so much of my time. The 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 gentleman was is colorblind and and he has a and he has he can't see red nor green and so and he wanted a Grand Canyon and they wanted this major Grand Canyon for their home and so I I, I got absorbed in how to make this painting work for this gentleman and it required that the painting have have lots of yellow and blue in it so that he could see all of the, the different planes and that, that it also have enough contrast and be sharp enough that he could see it. And so, uh, but anyway, it, 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 it took me several months actually to get through it. And, and, um, cause it was a big, big, it was a wall called the alligator at Grand Canyon, which is from looking east out of, from Pima point. But anyway, it's just huge amount of geology in this wall and very complicated. And so it took me a long time to paint it. Um, so it's, it, it, it just, it was the time issue that was the, my thing about it, but it turned out and the gentleman was in tears when he saw it. And so it was worth it all, but oh, good. Um, okay. yeah, yeah. He was very emotional and loved the painting. He and his wife love it. And so it, I, I'm of course redeemed, but, but it was, um, I, I mean, I was really touched and really, and, you know, it's, it's really great that, that you love the painting, but, but, but it did take up a lot of my year. And so, um, and, and, and when you spend that long on a painting, you start to resent them in a sense that, that, uh, not after the fact, but while you're working on it, cause you want to be doing other things. And so, uh, at least that's me. And so I, I would prefer to, to, I, I, I'm better at painting when I feel like I'm in competition with I, it, with the guys, you know, if I'm painting for a purpose other than if I'm painting to be competitive with all of my, my contemporaries, then it's different than painting for someone. It's just different. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I get a charge out of painting for the, for the shows. What is your definition of a great painting? If it will stop me in my tracks and bring tears to my eyes, it's a great painting. And what's your definition of a great painter? A great painter. I, I, I'll tell you, I think it, it's sort of it's sort, so incredibly cliche, but but I get a real charge out of Sargent's paintings. I always, I always have. I always I think I always will. I, I just love John Singer Sargent, and those are my sort of go-to paintings. I love those. I love his art. Um I'm uh, I'm still I'm still a huge fan of Monet and I always have been and I just adore them and and I can be absorbed in a Monet painting for hours. So if you really if you happy. had if you had uh, if you could bring one of those guys back and get uh, one hour over dinner and you could ask him any question, who would you ask? Who would you invite back and what questions would you ask him? Can I answer you later? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a really good answer for you. <laughs> What would I ask them? Um, I don't know, but I would I would adore spending time with them. I can tell you that. I, I asked that question of somebody the other day. They said, "I just want to watch them paint." Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I I'm, I'm going through. What would I? Yes, I think I just want to watch them paint. I really would. <laughs> well, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of question about how Sargent painted and whether he was slow and meticulous or. Um, fast and rambunctious. Um, no, I think he, I honestly think he was fast and rambunctious. He did too much work and, and you can tell from the, from the brushwork. And I mean, he stood back from those canvases and painted. I, I know he did. You can tell. 
Well, there's a, there's awesome. a lot there's a lot of conflicting opinions about that. I I don't know which one is right. I I know there are some contemporary painters who I value very highly who look like they you know they're fast and rambunctious, but they're very deliberate in making it look that way. But they do yes. it. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I understand. I understand. Okay. So a, a couple last questions, then then sure. I'm going to let you get back to it. So it's your last day on Earth. You get a chance to go anywhere in the world and do one last painting. Or where where would it be and describe it for me? It'd be Machu Picchu. <laughs> That's where I'm going to go. And it would be, I don't know what size it would be, but it would be of Machu Picchu. That's what I'd be doing. Okay. That came right to your mind. Oh, yeah, because that's what I want to do. So here's another final day on Earth question. Sure. Uh, it's your final day on Earth. Every painting that you've ever created has disappeared from the Earth. And you are asked to write down three truths that you can pass on to others. What would they be? Three truths? I think that if you do what you love, you're going to have a great life. Uh, the, the other one is, is that it helps to have someone in your life that really loves you and is your advocate. And, and I think that's really important. Um, I think a good partnership is, is almost critical. And um, I don't know. I think, I think those are the two. Those are good answers. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Eric. Well, that was one of the best interviews ever. I really appreciate Kurt Walters doing that. The interview was sponsored by easelbrushclip.com. It is a cool tool, and everybody's picking one up for their easels. Watch the video at easelbrushclip.com. This podcast, number 10, brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, the world's largest gathering of outdoor artists. I should mention that Kurt Walters will be on stage as one of our faculty members. Uh, we have over 60 faculty members teaching oil, watercolor, pastel, urban sketching, and more. And I'm working on three very new, distinct art marketing boot camp sessions that will give you more guidance in selling art. Uh, March 24th, the price of the Plein Air Convention goes up another $200, and I think we're going to hit sellout very soon. So book your seats today, www.plenairconvention.com. Remember, the Plein Air movement is hot, which may be why Plein Air Magazine is at the top in art sales at the magazine newsstands, Barnes & Noble, and so on. So drop by and pick one up or get yourself a subscription at plenairmagazine.com. Well, this is always fun. Let's do it again sometime, like next week. I'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. And remember, it's a big world out there, so go paint it. We'll see you. Goodbye-bye. <laughs>